always good to speak after a dance, I would say. <laughs> okay, so my name is uh, Richard Quack. I'm a medical oncologist. I'm a specialist. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, today to Manila, Philippines to give this talk. As the only overseas speaker, I feel very privileged to be here to share with you. And as I thought about my talk, talk this morning, um, as I listened to all the business leaders, I was wondering, my talk, it's a little bit different from everybody else. But I thought that given the opportunity, I'll, I'll raise the awareness of cancer among the community, and this is passionate to myself. And if I could just do that bit for the community and for all the business leaders out there, then I've succeeded today. So in essence, I'll say that the treatment of cancer has evolved significantly over the last four decades or five decades. Uh, it has grown from strength to strength. The results we were getting is better. Uh, patients are doing much better. But unfortunately, one in three of us in your community, in this room, in your offices, in your workforce, will develop cancer in a lifetime. And, and this is something that we need to be aware about, and this is something that we need to be sensitive about, and this is an opportunity for us to do something about. The outline of my talk today is very simply, number one, how can we prevent cancer? None of us like to have cancer. How can we do it? Secondly, if we, should detect cancer, if we should have cancer, can we detect it early? And thirdly, how best can we treat it? I think the first two slides will be very pertinent to all the, the, the leaders out here because this is something that you can influence uh, your colleagues, your workforce in terms of cancer prevention. I think the first five speakers had, uh, had, had very eloquently talked about you know, the programs in their, in their companies, uh, in their work uh, areas. Um, and this is something that we can work together. Primarily, number one, the biggest offender in terms of cancer development is tobacco. If you can stop your colleagues from smoking, if you can uh, reduce their, their urge, you can help them improve, then you would have reduced at least, I would say, 20% of cancers. If you go to India, the highest cancer is still hair and neck cancers and, and lung cancer, and it's typically smoking related. If you can discourage your workforce from, from, from smoking, give them um, whatever support they need, that can really help the community. Number two, healthy living. It's easier said than done. You know, we've talked about smoking, we've talked about being ex uh, exercising, losing weight, and, and doing a dance halfway through our session. And this is very important because healthy diet, healthy living, prevention of obesity is a true way to reduce cancer. And that's one of the reasons why the incidence in the West is actually going up. Fruits and vegetables, without saying, um, we've heard about speakers talking about, you know, healthy diet, healthy fruits and vegetables uh, uh, for, for their workforce. And number three is lifestyle. We have heard the previous speaker talk about exercise. And exercise is important because it loses weight. It keeps people fitter cardiovascularly. Um, but important to mention to our, our triathlete is that when you, hook, when you head out to the, to, the, to, the, to, the tri to the stadium to do your exercise, please put on your sunscreen because we don't want sun damage. We don't want melanoma. And that's something we want to uh, be very mindful about. In this country, I don't know whether you guys use beetle nuts, but in Taiwan, in the, some of the Chinese uh, countries, we use a lot of beetle nuts, and that is a major cause of concern for mouth, throat cancers. And finally, risky behavior. What does risky behavior mean? HIV is one risky behavior. Um, if you can reduce that, reduce HIV transmission, or early recognition, uh, awareness, and treatment, you can reduce the incidence of lymphoma. And similarly, hepatitis B and C. Of late, um, in Asia, what used to be very common was hepatitis B liver cirrhosis. So liver cirrhosis causing liver cancer, and that's hepatitis B related. I believe that many of us in this room have been vaccinated against hep B, and that's one way to avoid hepatitis B and avoid liver cancer. But let's not forget human papilloma virus, that's called the HPV, and that's related to cervix cancer in women, it is related to hair and neck cancers in both gender. And if vaccinations can take place, then again, you can avoid, prevent cancer so that it never happens. That's something the, the, the business leaders in this room can help uh, uh, decide and, and work on. But unfortunately, despite our best efforts, cancer still form, still develop in, in all of us. And important is we can bring about cancer detection. And in your health programs that you have in your companies, do consider having these programs for the appropriate age group. And this could be your, may, not, may not be your millennials, they could be your business uh, managers, they are, uh, the team leaders who are of the eight appropriate age group. Cervix cancer screening can be easily checked by a pap smear and you can avoid that. In Singapore, for pregnant women, as part of the obstetrics package, we check pap smear and our cervix cancer rates are actually very, very low. The ladies uh, by 50, breast mammogram, once every two years, can, can result in early detection and early uh, treatment of cancer resulting in good outcome. Above 50 in both gender, colonoscopy, 
in conjunction with healthy diet, vegetables, uh, fruits and vegetables can avoid uh, colon cancer, early detection. And for those of us who've got hepatitis B, regular screening, uh, liver cancer screening with blood tests, ultrasound, can all um, work wonders in terms of early detection. Now, unfortunately, again, I always say, if, if this, despite our best efforts, a small group of us may still develop cancer, and, and therefore, what are the tools we have in our armamentarium? We have always known about chemotherapy, and this is what we are always fearful about, but I'd like to take you through the developments in the last two decades, the last 20 years, and that's really com completely changed the landscape of oncology, and that's what I'm very excited about. First and foremost, let's take a look at history, what, 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 what we have been doing in the past many years, and the history of chemotherapy started in World War I. So chemo was first not developed to treat and cure people. It was meant to kill people. Uh, it was used as a, as a weapon of mass destruction in World War I, a mustard gases. And the, the, the effective chemotherapy only came about in the 1970s. And we had the modern day treatment uh, as what we know as chemo. By the early 1990s, we decided to ramp up the dose of chemo and we tried to poison everybody with large and high doses with some success. In the late 1990s, we came up with immunotherapy, the first front runner, and early 2000s, targeted therapy, which is what you hear a lot about, targeted treatment, you know, the, the sniper, the magic bullet, you know, that kind of thing, which I'll talk about in a short while. And of late, immunotherapy, which Dr. Beaver mentioned briefly just now. So this is, in a, in a nutshell, the history of our treatment so far. Now, these are agents that you have read about. Your, you may have close encounters, your friends, your family may have had cancer and it needed treatment. And these treatments are unpleasant. They go about in terms of breaking the DNA of a cell. Uh, anything that's fast growing will be destroyed by the chemotherapy regardless of whether it's good or bad. And as a result, cancer may die, but patients also lose their hair, develop mouth ulcers, um, also have vomiting problems, diarrhea because the intestines are affected, fever and fatigue. Unpleasant. And that brought us to the era of targeted treatment. And, and you have heard a lot about targeted treatment. Everybody wants a targeted treatment. And if you compare chemo to be a nuclear weapon, the targeted treatment is a sniper rifle, just right at the tumor, but leaving everything else untouched. And the good cells will be um, uh, unaffected, mostly, I would say. But to understand how immu uh, uh, Im this targeted therapy works, one needs to understand that the living cell is a highly regulated cell. The fact that you're here, and me and here suggest our cells work in a very coordinated fashion. We don't start growing another arm or leg or somewhere. So it's highly regulated. And how is this regulation likened to? Think about it as a road traffic junction. A road traffic junction has got traffic lights. This is a red light. If the red light shines, the green car cannot move. Correct? This is how a traffic light works. And the green car is stalled. The green light moves, and this car will then move forward. So it's very tightly regulated. A cell grows, divides, stops. It's, it's a very coordinated process. But in a cancer, what happens is that there are mutations, there are abnormalities onto these traffic light junctions, which are proteins, which cause the, the, the green light to be on all the time. And therefore, you have a one-directional flow of traffic. As a result, what happens is that you have a lock jam. All the cars move in one direction, it then bunches up together to form this huge gem of cells. In this case, the analogy is a car causing a cancer growth. And from here, it will spread. So if this is the logic, all of you in, in this room will, will tell me that identify the mutation. All you need to do is block the mutation, right? Design a drug like the way we design stuff, block the mutation, and it's very effective, I would say. And the first front runner we have is actually GIS. It's a form of sarcoma that, was, that I, I've been working on for many years. And you can see that there's a tumor growth, there's a lump on over there. And this GIST was the first disease that we can use a designer drug, block it because the GIST is addicted to a mutation. And then by blocking the mutation, the GIST will shrink such as this. You see this big tumor over here where the arrow is? In time to come, it gets smaller with treatment and smaller and smaller. While it's difficult to operate the first one on the top left, it's not difficult to operate the one on the bottom left. So shrink it down and cut it away. This is the way to go and it's very effective. However, there's a problem of drug resistance. If we can do this and the patient remain well forever, we have actually cured cancer and there's no need for me to give a talk here. But of course, what happens is that whenever we are faced with a cancer cell, the cancer cell is also living just like us. It's also trying to evolve and survive. And so what happens is that while we block with medication and we slam shut this gateway, what happens is that the cancer cell will then take a detour, a bypass, 
It's just like the way when you're stuck in a traffic jam, you'll go bypass around the blockade. And this is exactly what the cancer cell will try to do after a period of time, typically one year. And therefore, targeted treatment do not completely kill off the cells. It means that once the treatment is stopped, the cancer cells may grow again. And not all cancers have mutations that we can target. A lot of cancers do not have specific mutations that we can target. Only a, a list of them would have it. <clears throat> and so that brings me to checkpoint inhibitors, also called immunotherapy. If you Google cancer, there's no way you will miss this word immunotherapy these days. Essentially what it means uh, is uh, the work of these two people, Nobel Prize winners in 2018, James Allison from Texas and Tasuku Honjo from Kyoto, Japan. Life's work, but that resulted in a, in a in Nobel Prize in, in this year. But the story of immunotherapy started 150 years ago, and it started with an American surgeon called William Coley. Uh, he's, he's a surgeon. <coughs> he, he came to the conclusion that for the cancers he operated on, for the people who develop infection due to some kind of nasty bug, they tend to do better, they live longer, the, the cancer gets better uh, uh, remission. And so he thought that was strange. Maybe that's something to do with immunity. If, if the infection comes, your immune system is aroused, it, it kills the infection, it also helps with the cancer. So he decided to implant infection in all his patients. And clearly you can't do that these days to patients, right? Give, give them a jab of bacteria. But in the past you could, 150 years ago, and that was the start of immunotherapy. Our immune system is again very strong. Again, all of you sitting right here tells me that your immune system is strong. You're not caught a cold from your neighbor and not killed over from it. And this immune system uh, protects us against invaders and it's very tightly regulated. Too weak an immune system will result in infection. And it's too much, the immune system will then, will then attack our own body, resulting in joint problems, liver, kidney problems, and so on and so forth. This is a cartoon. Now, the green block over on the far left is a immune cell and one in the middle is actually a cancer killing cell and basically they ramp up the immune system and to kill the cancer on the far right. But in a living body, the cancer cell has also ability to dampen our immune system. Our immune system also controls it somewhat so that we do it doesn't become overactive. When it becomes overactive, we'll have end up with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, we have lupus and all that kind of thing. So this yin and yang uh, 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 process goes on, it's very tightly controlled. But in a cancer world, what happens is that the cancer is able to dampen the immune system much better. It's able to evade our defenses. <clears throat> so imagine if you have a patient who, and you take a piece of cancer cell out of the, the patient and you implant it onto my body, that cancer will never grow on my body because my immune system, the, the, bar on the, the red bar on top, will then effectively be mobilized and you'll kill away all the cancer cells. But then the question is, why didn't it kill away the cancer cell in the patient? So if you can figure that out, you would have won a Nobel Prize yourself. Okay, so the immune system is in check and we always forget that we keep pouring chemo into people, <coughs> uh, more and more stuff, more and more treatment, but we forget that there's an immune dampener in place. If we don't take away the brake of the immune dampener, the car will never move forwards. Take away the brakes and the car will then move forwards. Another picture I'd like to show is um, uh, shared with me by my colleague who's sitting in the audience and this is the immune system. It's on a leash, it's a dog, it's an attack dog that's on a leash. Your immune system is on a leash, there's a cancer cell in our body and the leash is very tight and the cancer cells are untouched because the, the, the immunity is not um, unleashed. Cancer cell becomes very happy, they propagate and take over our body. Just imagine you have a mechanism, cut the leash away and the cancer cells will get eaten up by the dog. Absolutely simple. So that development of the scissors, again, is the Nobel Prize. Okay, so these people work on the, the different pathways resulting in different compounds out in the market now and one of them belongs to MSD, one of the front runners uh, uh, which is Keytruda pembrolizumab. Okay, so the story started of immuno immunotherapy started with skin cancer melanoma. So you can see this patient with a very uh, bad looking skin cancer developing um, and prior to 2010 there's no treatment for melanoma. The immunotherapies that we have, the interferons were completely not useful at all. And by the early 2010s, when they applied this medicine, you can see the tumor regressing very nicely. We have never seen this before. And the best part is that the bottom right, you can see at week 108, that means two years, the patient is still in complete remission. So you have effectively converted a deadly disease to a chronic disease like diabetes. So this is what you want to do. You, you want to stop people from dying and then moving them into chronic disease and you can control the disease. Um, and if you were to stop treatment in some of these patients these days, the cancer remains controlled. It's like as if the immune system is now aware of the cancer, it continues to do its work and continues to kill the cancer cells and protect the body against the cancer. And that's the beauty of immunotherapy. 
So this highlights that now 40% of the patients uh, remain in long-term disease control uh, uh, despite advanced stage 4 disease. And our best case uh, uh, poster child is President Carter. This is uh, ex-American president. He has got melanoma spread to the brain, liver. He's about three to four years out with treatment and he's completely well. Some months ago, I saw him on TV uh, giving an interview. But of course, some of you in the crowd may be skeptics and you say that, okay, uh, so what? Melanoma is not common in Asia. Uh, maybe it's, is it effective in other types of cancer? Are the effects durable? And this is what the answer is. Now, the, the, the drugs have been tested in a whole range of cancers from head to toe, melanoma, skin cancer, lung cancer, bladder, lymphoma, so on and so forth. And they've all been shown to work and this has been approved by FDA and the European regulatory authorities and many parts of Asia as well. Now imagine the drug doesn't kill the cancer, the drug just goes into your body and enhances your immune system and your immune system does its job and therefore it's agnostic to all the cancers. And we see success, we see long-term control, and the question is how can we do better at this point in time? Are we happy with what we have? Probably not, uh, as cancer doctors. And now we are thinking about timing. How can we improve on our treatment? Number one, timing. We have so far tested in patients on the bottom left, treatment in advanced cancer, stage four, people with you know, less options, and we have seen successes. Can we move it forwards to test it out in patients who have resected disease, p disease which has been removed and you want to prevent the cancer and that's just a preventive strategy and prevention is always better than cure. Thirdly, can we shrink it down like what I showed just now before we do surgery and this is something that's ongoing and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Can we combine with other medicine to enhance the effect? And clearly we can combine with different classes, work done by um, James Allison and Honjo together and this is what we call combined immunotherapy we can also combine with chemo, we can combine with targeted therapy and combine with various agents to enhance the effect. And this just goes to show one of my patients who, whom I've treated has got melanoma and the, the red spots are, 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 are the disease. She's been treated with a period of immunotherapy and the disease got worse. So I, I wasn't that keen but she wanted to try something different and we said okay, we'll combine the immunotherapy and lo and behold, very resistant disease all disappeared. You can see the bright orange yellow dots in the liver have regressed with combination treatment. And this is March 2018, she has been with it for two years in a patient with advanced melanoma, stage four, who has failed immunotherapy. And by combining it, you can get enhanced outcome. Okay, and the question now is that if we have good results, is it at expense of patients' uh, our, our well-being? The answer is no. In fact, immunotherapy is actually less toxic than your traditional treatment. The side effects are very, very manageable. Uh, I would say only one in 10 people get any significant side effects and they're usually due to an overstrong immune system. Your immune system goes to attack the skin, liver, kidney, so on and so forth. And so to end my talk, I've got the last two minutes. I'd like to end with a, with a case I have. And this is a, a young patient of mine. He's in his 20s. He's got Hodgkin's lymphoma. He's got relapse disease. After initial treatment, he came back and then he came to see us and then we have tried different lines of chemo very aggressive, strong chemotherapy, and we wanted to do transplantation. But unfortunately, he's resistant to all diseases, and he's increasingly breathless. Okay, and this is a normal x-ray. Hopefully, our x-rays look like this, uh, you and mine. But this is his x-ray. So you can see the entire right side, the lung, is collapsed with disease. The left side, the top part is almost gone. The bottom part is very hazy, and that's tumour. So his lungs are filled with tumour, that's why he's breathless. And the reason why he's still breathing is because he's 20 years old. If he was 60, he would have stopped breathing. He has a lot of reserve in that sense. So unfortunately, this is where he finally made his decision in middle 2016. And we had to give treatment while he was in ICU. Within four days, his entire right lung cleared up with immunotherapy. The left lung started to show signs of recovery. And in three weeks, this is his lung fields. He could get off the machine by day two. And now he's traveling the world. Uh, on vacation. He comes to see us once every three to four weeks, gets a shot, and he goes off. And this is 2016 to now, that's a good two years plus for a 20 or plus year old, disease well control. And this is the power of immunotherapy. I'm just basically unleashing his immunotherapy on his own cancer, um, and that's exactly what we're doing. So in conclusion, cancer can be prevented, uh, but we need certainly to encourage our friends, our staff to do the right thing. Cancer can be found early, and it's best treated early. And treatment has changed considerably in the last decade and it gives us hope to all the patients, the caregivers, and to oncologists like myself alike. 
And with that, I thank you for your kind attention.